Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Here are the headlines. Flight set to be gradually resuming following a technical glitch in the United States. Former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro discharged from hospital as a country senator proves federal intervention in the capital. And ambulance workers in England and Wales hold a second year strike over pay and working conditions. Let's begin the world today. Normalcy is returning to airports across the United States following hours of delay due to technical glitch. A Federal Aviation Authority says there was a problem with the system that alerts pilots to potential hazards on flight routes. It was a problem with the notice to air mission system. It says now it is safe for planes to take to the skies again. Flights in New Jersey's Newark airports and those in Hartsville, Jackson, Atlanta resumed shortly after the FAA's latest announcement. While major airlines said they were monitoring the situation, international flights felt the impact, even though some were still able to meet their schedules. The U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says he has been in contact with the FAA all morning and they have been working to resolve the situation. To Botrus, the FAA did send out the suite earlier, saying U.S. flights were slowly resuming departures and a ground stop had been lifted as it tried to fix the problem. The FAA is expected to implement a ground delay program in order to address the backlog of flights halted for hours. Flights already in the air were allowed to continue to their destinations. The FAA said it was working to restore a system that alerts pilots to hazards and changes to airport facilities and procedures that had stopped processing updated information. A NOTAM is a notice containing information essential to personnel concerned with flight operations but not known far enough in advance to be publicized by other means. Well, President Joe Biden commented on the situation while in Mexico when he was asked about it by reporters. Right, President uh, Joe Biden did comment on the situation while in Mexico when he was asked about it by reporters, uh, saying he had ordered an investigation into the system outage. The president said he'd already spoken with the Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg. Okay, I just spoke with Buttigieg. They don't know what the cause is, but I was on the phone in about 10 minutes. I told them to report directly to me when they find out. Aircraft can still land safely, just not take off, off right now. We don't know what the cause of it is. They expect it to be able to in a couple hours they'll have a good sense of the cause of and, uh, and we'll respond at that time. Uh, why did they have your We don't know. Okay, we'll find well, out. Well, what's 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 Our correspondent in Washington, Maria Bird, joins us now. Maria, how much of a disruption was caused by this situation? Uh, this disruption, I think, is something that was not involved. Disruption is something that we've not seen here in recent times. And with all the challenges we've been dealing with the airlines here in the U.S., um, this is not something that's being welcomed uh, by many travelers and is putting major delay on the rest of the day. And we had mentioned very briefly the impact on international flights, but were they really affected on a large scale? They have been affected on a large scale. What we're going to probably see is that we'll see many of, as you're showing here, um, the flights that are planned for the day. You're going to see many delays, many cancellations. Uh, there will also be uh, some that will have to be moved to another day. Um, and so obviously this was unexpected on the, on the plans of the FAA. But by 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, they were able to rectify the issue. And Maria, how much, uh, how much confidence is there now in American air travel saying this is happening just a couple of weeks after the holidays when lots of flights were cancelled because of the weather? 
Well, the greatest challenge here is that there's two different pieces. The FAA, um, where we see the challenge here today, that was really due to being able to uh, manage the air traffic. Um, and the airline issues that we saw during the holiday was as a result of airlines not having the capacity to fly the, fly, the, the planes, whether it was a lack of airline stewards or pilots, um, a lack of actual planes that were available, um, scheduling things that just did not align with that specific airline's ability for the day. And so those, these are two separate issues. It's just a very uh, challenge uh, that it's like two major storms coming together um, and creating a major challenge for travelers and could be seen um, as potentially a, a, a not a lack of confidence um, in the U.S. airline system. Thanks a lot, Maria. Let's go out to those whose uh, flights have been canceled or rescheduled. Back to President Joe Biden now, who's still in Mexico attending the North America summit with the Mexican president and the Canadian prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Late Tuesday, the Mexican president said he had urged his U.S. counterpart to press Congress for immigration reform to help regularize the migratory status of millions of, of Mexicans in the U.S. He says it would help President Biden clamp down on the trade in the synthetic opioid fentanyl uh, blamed for thousands of deaths in the U.S. But in another development, President Biden also answered questions from reporters regarding the classified documents found in a think tank office he once used and said he and his team are cooperating fully with a review into what happened. The president told reporters it takes classified documents seriously and he did not know what was in the documents. Well, Cubans are still frantic to escape the economic crisis in their country and are watching closely what decisions will come out of the meeting in Mexico, especially after the U.S. Ruled out, rolled out a set of uh, rules at the border to dramatically change the landscape for the island's would-be migrants. The new regulations block Cubans at the border, putting the brakes on, routes, on a route favored by many. A flight to Nicaragua, which lifted its U.S. visa requirements in late 2021 on Cubans, and then overland journey north through Central America and Mexico to the U.S. border. The fresh regulations, however, open a new avenue to enter the United States legally, aimed at bringing order. The administration is set to record-breaking exodus of upwards of 250,000 migrants who arrived from Cuba in the past year alone. In October 2022, the West imposed a similar carrot and stick approach to migrants from Venezuela. Venezuelans arriving at the southwest U.S. border plunged from 1,100 per day to under 200 per day in just one week. The Biden administration has bet Cubans will respond in the same way. And staying in the United States, we're looking at the damage caused by the latest Pacific storm unleashed in California. More than 33 million people were threatened by severe weather throughout Tuesday as heavy to excessive rainfall was expected across the state. High winds, though, have damaged the power grid, knocked out electricity to tens of thousands of people. Over 200,000 homes are currently without electricity. There were forced evacuations as well. Emergency services have warned that the treacherous weather expected to dump as much as seven inches of rain in some parts by today. Could produce widespread flooding, rapid water rises, mudslides and landslides, especially in areas where the ground has been saturated from previous heavy rainfall. Oh. <laughs> and residents in the affluent town of Montecito near Santa Barbara, where some of those where some of those were ordered to evacuate as a result of the weather. For some, it triggered memories of the 2018 mudslide, which killed 23 people. The Montecito evacuation zone was among 17 California regions where authorities are concerned the ongoing torrential downpour can unleash mud, boulders, and other debris in the hillsides. Cleanup efforts began early as volunteers, business owners, and city workers began cleaning up debris and mudslides affecting the downtown business area. Community members are drawing on past experiences now and preparing for the next storm. We're checking in on Brazil now. After the riot that took place at government offices in the capital, Brasilia, on Sunday, Senate on Tuesday approved a federal intervention. A security intervention had been decreed by Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva after the riots on Sunday, but we're still waiting for the green light from Congress. 
the lower house unanimously approved the intervention late on Monday. President of the Senate, Rodrigo Pacheco, called the acts crimes and said those involved in the destruction of the Congress are being identified. Brazilian police have questioned some 1,000 protesters already. Meanwhile, former President Jair Bolsonaro has been released from hospital near Orlando, Florida, in the United States, where he had been treated for intestinal blockade, a result of a 2018 stabbing during campaigns. A video footage we're looking at right now shows Bolsonaro on Tuesday exiting a vehicle and entering a house in a gated community in Kissimmee, Florida, where he's staying after being released from hospital. Bolsonaro, who flew to Florida 48 hours before his term ended, was admitted to the hospital a day after hundreds of his supporters rampaged through key government buildings in Brasilia. And the Brazilian Supreme Court Justice Gilman Mendes had to hold back tears as he visited the court complex to examine the damage caused by the riots on Sunday. In a short statement after his tour inside the Supreme Court building, Mendes said Brazilians must do everything to prevent such events from happening again. A ransacked building was a site most damaged by the rioters who largely identified as supporters of the right-wing former president, Jair Bolsonaro. Mendes was only able to comment no words, no words. How did we get to this point? We have to do everything to prevent this from happening again. Let's talk to the VOA's Edgar Marcel, Marcel, beg your pardon, in Sao Paulo. Edgar, thanks for joining us on the program and uh, taking time to speak with us. How is the Brazilian capital now, days after the riots? Hi, Marachi. Good afternoon from Brazil. After days of great uh, tension, the climate in Brasilia is very calm right now. Brazil's capital is under federal in-depth observation until the end of this month, which means that the army and national forces troops are in charge of security. We call it Três uh, Poderes Square here in Brazil because it's a place that brings together Congress, uh, the Supreme Court, and the Planalto Palace, uh, which, they have, which is where the president works, and that was the place that in Verde is uh, completely destroyed on Sunday. Uh, the city is still accounting uh, for the damage. Uh, the Supreme Court building, we can say, it was 80% destroyed and will take some time to get back uh, to normal. President Lula has convened meetings uh, with all the leaders uh, of the judiciary powers and also of parliament. He also met with the governance. This is to demonstrate uh, uh, unity that the government uh, and the country uh, wants to respect democracy, that the co-plotters that were supporters of former President uh, Jair Bolsonaro are being classified, do not have uh, the strength uh, to overthrow uh, him from the power. So, so Marcel, I'm hearing you say, you know, that um, uh, the Supreme Court offices were 80 percent destroyed. Um, where are they meeting now, as well as the other government offices that were in the same complex that were attacked by the rioters? Uh, yes, uh, the majority are, are supporters of President Lula. You mean the, the, the pro-democracy protests? Sorry, Amarachi, I, I didn't hear you well. Can you repeat no, the I'm question, just, please? Just, yeah, okay, so I'm just wondering, you know, where um, these government officials are meeting currently now with many of the offices destroyed on Sunday. Yeah, many officers are, are destroyed on Sunday, especially in Congress. Uh, that means uh, the Chamber of Deputies and the Congress uh, plan of party was totally destroyed. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, was the, plen the, the main plenarium uh, was uh, there for the, 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 main, uh, the main building in Brazil. So we're still counting the, the destroy here in Brazil. It's, it's very sad to see what happened in Brasilia because it's not normal uh, in Brazil, this kind of uh, accomplishment of the, the population. So uh, we are it's still in shock here in Brazil, we can say that. Yeah, and I suppose the meeting in offices outside of theirs. And there was also a pro-democracy protest, uh, Edgar, in Sao Paulo, where you are. Uh, this happened yesterday. They were condemning the riots on Sunday. Are there also mm -hmm. Bolsonaro supporters in Sao Paulo? 
Yes, there are, of course. Uh, these pro-democracy protests are mainly supporters of President Lula, people yeah. who defend produce democracy. Remember that Brazil ended an election in a very polarized, very divided way. The difference uh, in votes between Lula and Bolsonaro last October was only 2%, uh, which made radicals suspicious of the final result, with even the electoral court uh, saying that election was clean here in Brazil. So this pro-democracy protest should gain strength uh, in the coming days uh, with the demonstration scheduled for this weekend. On the other hand, uh, we have indications that the radicals do not give it up so easily. So uh, the leader, leader of the invasion here in Brazil, they try to close highways here in Sao Paulo. Uh, they, they continue to organize themselves to try their best to disrupt uh, this beginning of a new government here in Brazil. So uh, yes, uh, we can wait for new attempts for uh, at a coup and invasions because uh, the radicals must not give up so easily. Indeed, and we understand that some of those protesters arrested on Sunday and on Monday have been released. What about the others? Marching toward more uh, than 105 uh, 100 people have been arrested since uh, Sunday. They stay in a federal um, police gymnasium uh, in Brazil, screening people. Um, the police uh, release people considered elderly with serious health problems and mothers with young children. That's true, there were uh, children in the midst of this invasion here in Brazil. The last information we received is that almost 700 invaders came in prison uh, in Brasilia, and they will be sent um, to federal prisons for crimes against democracy and also for violating public uh, property. Um, this group um, is considered to have last Sunday, uh, have to have led the, the last Sunday's invasion in Brasilia, and, and it also is expected to be prosecuted and for attempt of, uh, of group against the Brazilian state. Really interesting. And so talk to us, can, talk to us sorry, about... Can also expect, go on. Uh, go sorry, on. Uh, we can also expect new uh, harassments here in Brazil. Um, Justice uh, wants to find out who finance uh, these groups of more than 2,000 people who invade in Brasilia with the intention of taking power here in Brazil. Th thanks for that, Edgar. And do talk to us some more about you know, what the Senate has decided. They approved a federal intervention. What does that mean? Yeah, the president here in Brazil, Amorachi, uh, the president of the republic, has the power to request a federal intervention when one of the Brazilian states is unable to respond uh, about the security of this state. In this case, uh, the federal district where in Brasilia is a state, uh, they would be responsible for the security of uh, the Trispoder Square. What we saw is that the governor of this of the state uh, took a long time to to take an action in the invasion of the these demonstrators. Uh, there is the why the government did to intervene in this process here in Brasilia. Uh, the court uh, even decreed the removal of the governor of uh, District Federal Ibanez Rocha and. They also arrest of the Secretary of Security and the heads of these operations. What uh, this Senate did yesterday was to approve uh, this measure by the federal uh, government, the federal intervention, to maintain the intervention in Brasilia until the end of the January, uh, because any protesters, any manifestations uh, could happen again in Brasilia, uh, and they also trying to invade, also trying to block highways throughout Brazil, and it can cause uh, more confusion in our country here in Brazil. Well, praying the things settle down there. Um, Edgar, thank you so much for reporting uh, on the situation in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Welcome back to the program.
A strike's continued for ambulance workers in Britain. They want more pay and better working conditions. Thousands of ambulance workers, including paramedics, call handlers, drivers and technicians across England and Wales, have staged a walkout after talks with Health Minister Steve Barclay have failed to produce a breakthrough. In London, ambulance staff held placards and banners at a picket line outside the London Ambulance Service. Britain is experiencing a wave of industrial action as pay rises fail to keep up with double-digit inflation, which is now around 40-year highs. Nurses, ambulance staff and rail workers are among those who have staged the walkouts. The British government introduced legislation to Parliament on Tuesday, which will require key public services to maintain minimum safety levels during strike action by the workers. So the Secretary of State's now really clear. He's acknowledged that he understands that resolving this dispute isn't going to be a case of talking about pay for the future. It's going to need making improvements to the current pay year. That means making us an offer that improves pay ahead of April the 1st. We've been really clear about that. The Secretary of State has acknowledged that position. Let's see if he can secure the funding needed from the Chancellor to do that. So Monday was significant because we had a meeting with the Secretary of State and we were able to talk for the first time about pay. That's a long way from where we need to be, which is having proper negotiations. The Secretary of State made a commitment that he would come back to us and confirm whether that was going to happen. Let's see whether it does. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak had a lot of questions to answer. Uh, Prime Minister's questions in Parliament today over the current strikes in the country. He says the, country, the current strikes with the ambulance workers especially is terrifying for patients. Today has been day two for those workers who say they will only be responding to emergency cases. And one of the trade unions representing them, Unison, whose spokesperson we saw there earlier, says the government had ample time to address the issue before now. But he talks about what's terrifying, Mr Speaker. What's terrifying is right now, what's terrifying is that right now, people not knowing whether when they call 999, they will get the treatment that they need. Now, Mr Speaker, in, in, Australia, in Australia and Canada and the US, they ban strikes on blue light services. We're not doing that. All we're saying is that in these emergency services, patients should be able to rely on a basic level of life-saving care. Why is he against that, Mr Speaker? There's not a minimum level of service any day because they've broken the NHS. But Mr Speaker, let me answer the lady directly. I am registered with an NHS GP. I have used independent health care in the past. I'll answer her question. I am registered with an NHS GP. I have used, I have used independent health care in the past. And I'm also grateful to the Friarich Hospital for the fantastic care they've given my family over the years. But the truth is, but the truth is, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to come from an NHS family, and that's why I'm passionately committed to protecting it with more funding, more doctors and nurses, and a clear plan to cut the waiting list. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're back and forth there for the British Prime Minister. Our London correspondent, Tenyala Oyetayo, joins us now. Tenny, are these strikes holding across the United Kingdom? Uh, Hi, Yeah, another week, another strike. Um, ambulance workers are uh, striking across the UK today. Um, this includes paramedics, call handlers, uh, drivers and technicians, and also um, that, that accounts to about 20,000 staff uh, in total on strike today. Uh, funny enough, today another group of NHS workers, physiotherapists, also announced that they are going to join in the strike action on the 26th of January and the 9th of February. Uh, so the numbers keep adding up. So who is in the hospitals, you know, if these uh, workers are out there protesting uh, and asking for more pay and better working conditions? 
So, you know, the, the government has been engaged with all striking unions, uh, though no progress has been made uh, with this talks so far. Uh, while the ambulance service provides life-saving treatment, their salaries are well uh, below the national average for many. But apart from pay, uh, many of them are striking over the working conditions. Uh, the unions are demanding a pay rise above inflation, but they're also protesting about being stuck in ambulances outside a and E departments for long periods uh, rather than attending to new emergencies. So the squeeze on pay and mountain pressures meant that services are struggling uh, to fill vacancies and ambulance are struggling to respond to, uh, to calls. Uh, and according to unions, it's taken two to three times longer than it should uh, to reach emergency calls such as heart attacks and strokes. So like we've seen across the NHS, the pressure is a lot. Uh, but during the strikes, you know, uh, nurses are still in the hospitals. Uh, people are taking care uh, of patients. It's just that, you know, officials are saying that if it's not an emergency, don't come to the hospital. Um, so that's the case and the situation on ground. So the nurses who are in the hospital have also been complaining as well. And I know that before the holiday, they did um, uh, embark on a strike action. They, the rail workers, so the ambulance services as well. Uh, we've discussed their plight a few times, and we can see that the government's struggling to answer to the issues. What really is the situation in the hospitals right now, and is it safe to even come in for an appointment? You know, it's a lot to the point that many people are avoiding even going to the hospitals um, because appointment times are ridiculous. Of course, emergencies are being attended to, um, but we've heard of people dying, uh, waiting for ambulances. Nurses are stressed and overwhelmed. Medical staff are resigning to go work in supermarkets. So the NHS is under immense pressure and the cracks are starting to show. Um, so... The situation in hospitals is not the best right now. And officials are just saying that if it's not an emergency, don't come to the hospital. So are we looking at a full-blown health crisis on the horizon in the UK? Well... Well, the way it's going, possibly, depends on who you ask as well. Some people are already saying, you know, uh, we're already in the crisis. If nurses resign because they can't afford to stay in the job anymore, then yes, we are already in the crisis. But in terms of managing the health system during periods of strikes, um, the NHS has said that people's health will always be a priority. And the army have been, in the past, uh, I believe in December, uh, been brought in to help with the situation. But how long this can go on for is the issue. These nurses say they have no other option than to strike at this point, uh, battling the cost of living crisis. So, um, Tony, if uh, the nurses are complaining about pay and the government is saying we can't meet up with your demands, has uh, cost of health care gone up in the UK? Well, as you know, the health care in the UK is free. Uh, what nurses are asking for right now is basically more help. Uh, people are having to resign because, you know, it's better to have a job at a supermarket than to have a job as a nurse. Um, nurses are having to go to food banks to be able to avoid, uh, to be able to put food on the table. Uh, nurses are struggling to heat up their homes. So the situation is really critical at the moment. And many people are just, you know, giving up, saying they can't do this anymore. Uh, their, their job is to provide safety for patients, but they're unable to do this because they just isn't enough hands on deck. So if I'm hearing you correctly, and I'm hearing also the Prime Minister correctly, this is not a problem the government can solve immediately. No, it's not a problem. Uh, th that, that's what the government is saying. They're saying it's not a problem they can solve immediately. And in fact, they are proposing to introduce a bill, uh, which was proposed yesterday by the business secretary, uh, to impose minimum service levels on emergency service workers, the transport network, and then later throughout the public sector. The government says, you know, this is not meant to stop strikes, but to protect the public. Um, the bill, if passed, would mean a significant number of workers expected to be around 20% across the economy 
um, would have to keep working during industrial action. Uh, the bill will contain powers to sack workers who refuse uh, to work during a strike. So I think what this shows at this point is that, you know, a pay rise is not really an option right now uh, for the government. And they're looking at ways to avoid the disruptions that we've been seeing in the past month. Um, the government says that pay rise to match inflation is right now unaffordable. So, you know, how we're going to get over this deadlock, we'll have to wait and see. We'll indeed have to wait and see, but it is it does sound scary, uh, almost as if, uh, you know, those nurses are not as indispensable as uh, they would like to think. Thank you again, Tenny. We're heading on to France. Yep, and we're heading on to France. I'm sorry there, uh, producer speaking in my ear. At least six people have been injured in a suspected knife attack at Paris Gare du Nord Central Railway Station in the early hours of today. According to French authorities, a man with a knife attacked six people at the train station, leaving one with major injuries. A police spokesperson said an individual be began attacking people with a knife at 6.45 a.m. local time. And in the attack, was shot several times by police and taken to hospital with serious injuries. The police say the man's motivations were not immediately clear. The station is one of the busiest in Europe and a major link between Paris, London and the north of Europe. However, French rail operator SNCF says trains are operating normally now as police secure the area following the attack. Activists and police are preparing for a standoff in the abandoned western German village of Litzerath, ahead of the planned eviction of an activist by police. Demonstrators, many wearing masks and balaclavas, have been protesting out against the Gersweiler mine run by energy firm RWE in Litzerath, which is part of the brown coal district of the western state of North Rhine-Westphalia. They have formed human chains, staged sitting protests, and occupied deserted buildings in the town which will be raised to make way for the mine's expansion. Some dug themselves into holes in the ground, while others hung suspended from wooden tripods. On Tuesday, police began dismantling the barricades and dragged away the activists staging a sit-in at the expansion of an open-cast lignit mine that has highlighted, highlighted tensions over Germany's climate policy during an energy crisis. A protest uh, follows a regional court decision on Monday that upheld an early ruling to vacate the village whose land and houses now belong to RWE. A fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has prompted Scholl's government to change course on previous policies, as some include firing up mothballed coal power plants and extending the lifespan of nuclear power stations after Russia cut gas deliveries to Europe and an energy standoff that sent prices soaring. The government has, however, brought forward the date when all brown coal power plants will be shut down in North Rhine-Westphalia to 2030 uh, from tw to 2030 from 2038 according to a campaign promise from the greens And another protest, another climate protest in Spain this time. Over a thousand irrigators and farmers uh, held a protest earlier today in Madrid, the capital, just in front of the Ministry of Environment, calling on the government to increase the amount of water reaching agricultural land in the south, marking a resurgence of water war that had laid dormant for years in Spain. Agriculture workers and irrigation workers of the southern regions often referred to as the orchid of Europe want the government and the Ministry of Environment to put an end to its plan that seeks to increase the ecological flow of the Tigris River, which would reduce the amount of water that reaches the fertile agricultural land in Alicante, Mercia and Almera via the Tayo Segura water transfer, one of the largest works of hydraulic engineering ever produced in Spain. Sí, the Labour Union representing the irrigation workers argues a reduction of water would affect crop production and eliminate thousands of jobs. Spain's Environment Minister Teresa Rivera defended the plan, 
at a news conference on Tuesday saying a response for the first time to the reality of climate change and addresses both extreme situations involving a water crisis like longer cycles of extreme drought and flood periods. A prolonged dry spell and extreme heat made last July the hottest month in Spain since at least 1961. It also left Spanish reservoirs at just 40 percent capacity on average in early August. It's well below the 10-year average of around 60 percent according to official data. A migrant charity ship, the Ocean Viking, has docked at the Italian port city of Ancona. It was carrying 37 migrants uh, that were rescued off the coast of Libya in what it called extreme weather conditions. A video released by the charity's SOS Mediterranean showed migrants on board Ocean Viking with visibly rough sea conditions around the ship. A video also showed charity workers giving migrants medication and explaining to them the conditions. Migrants disembarked in Ancona in central Italy and on the country's east coast, far from the Sicily ports where NGO ships usually dock. A charity said in a tweet that the seven survivors of Ocean Viking just disembarked in Ancona, 1,575 kilometers away from the area of operations. On January 5th, the sea rescue charities condemned tough anti-immigration measures recently introduced by the Italian government, saying the new rules will cause even more deaths in the Mediterranean. The decree, which was introduced last week, says charity ships must request a port and sail to it without delay after rescue, rather than remain at sea looking for other migrant boats in distress, as now happens. Ship captains risk fines of 50,000 euros and having their boats impounded if they break the rules. Uganda has uh, declared an end to Ebola outbreak that killed more than 50 people in the country. That announcement follows a 42-day period without any confirmed cases. The outbreak, which began last September, caused particular concern as it was caused by the Sudan strain of Ebola, for which there is no vaccine. Cases were initially concentrated in the central region districts of Mubende and Kassanda, well, the outbreak began, but the epidemic seemed to be getting out of control when positive cases were recorded in at least seven other districts, including the capital, Kampala. And good news out of Africa, as the fastest man could be the fastest police officer eventually, Ferdinand Omania has graduated as a police constable in Kenya's police service. He was among the 2,881 constables who graduated on Tuesday from the National Police College in an event presided over by President William Ruto. The recruits finished the basic police training course, among other courses on human rights, community policing, public order management, skills at arms, and countering violent extremism, according to the National Police. Or he joins other top Kenyan athletes who are members of the police force. Omania set the African 100 meters record of 9.77 seconds in September 2021, he became African champion in June 2022, becoming the second Kenyan to become continental champion over the distance. We're on the last story now. Abbott Elementary about teachers at a predominantly black public school was named Best Television Comedy and received acting trophies for star and creator Kinta Bronson and supporting actor Tyler James Williams at the Golden Globes on Tuesday. Hollywood returned to a show that began that had been knocked off by television 
blocked off television being abandoned by scandal. Celebrities and broadcaster NBC had abandoned the 2022 no, Glows because of ethical wrongdoings at the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, a group that hands out these awards. The future of the Globes was thrown into doubt after a 2021 Los Angeles Times investigation revealed the organization had no black journalists in its ranks. Some members were accused of making sexist and racist remarks and soliciting favors from celebrities and movie studios. A larger, more diverse membership and other changes at the HFPA persuaded many of the biggest movie and TV stars to support this year's ceremony, which provides publicity for winners and nominees and often boosts their chances at the Oscars. Coming to the stage tonight for the White Lotus, our creator, writer, director, and executive producer, Mike. Jeffrey Dahmer story. This is Evan Peters' first nomination and first win. He wins his Golden Globe tonight for his role of Jeffrey Dahmer in Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. Oh my, some of those movies. Wow. Thanks for watching. I'm Rashi, but...